Hi guys, it's Sophie. So today I'm going to be doing my October wrap up. October's over, October's my favourite month, it's a bit sad. Um, I've read quite a lot and this is going to be just a bunch of everything. I'm not splitting it into fiction and non-fiction. Um, it might be quite long, so yeah, grab yourself a cup of tea and sit down and enjoy. The first one I have to show you is called The Book of the Cat. Um, and it is by Angus Highland and Caroline Roberts. And this book is essentially a non-fiction book about cats in art. Um, and it has lots of very beautiful pictures of cats in art. Um, and it kind of has uh, like some of them that you saw next to the cat in the rough. A little bit about um, what it was, what it means. Um, others have sort of famous cat quotes next to them. It's just really sweet. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's maybe like a, a Christmas stocking filler um, for a cat human. Um, but yeah, I really liked it. Um, there are some in there that are like, I think they must have been like ink drawings, but they look fluffy, which I just think is fantastic. I love, I love things that look like, like I feel like I could touch that cat. Um, yeah, so I really liked it. Um, and I, it's one I'm just going to keep like, looking through every now and again um, and I might actually try and track down one of them as like a print or like a postcard because I really like it so we'll see. And the next one I have um, I was really kindly sent by Waterstones um, and you've probably seen this one knocking around in their shops. Um, it is The Invisible Child and the Fir Tree. Um, it's two Moomin stories that um, have been bound up in just this really pretty little um, edition. Again I think this is like quite a good stocking for their book. Um, and they are to support the Invisible Child campaign um, that's about sort of forgotten children and people who've been subject to abuse. Um, the story of the Invisible Child is um, about a little girl who has been treated so poorly that she begins to um, disappear. And it's about trying to bring those people back into life and happiness and themselves. And it's just really touching. Um, the the, I think now all of the um, cost of this book is going straight to Oxfam, so going straight to charity um, for the Invisible Child campaign. And I just thought it was really sweet. It's been a long time since I read any Moomin stuff. Um, I think I must have been quite a little girl the last time I did. Um, and I didn't think I realised quite how sophisticated some of the storytelling is um, and the characters. Um, the, the edition also has, which I really liked, a little section at the back. Um, of the characters of the Moomins. Um, it's, it's, like, it's called the Moomin Gallery. Um, it has the little pictures of them and a little bit about them and where they are and what they like doing. Um, and that just gave me quite a lot of nostalgia because I used to watch the Moomins in the morning before I went to primary school. Um, so I thought that was really nice. Yeah, so if there's anyone, any small children or grown-ups who like it, I think it would be a good, like, again, another little stocking filler for you guys. And the next one I have is a very beautiful book. Um, it is The Strays by Emily Bitto. Um, this is a strange little book really. It's about two young girls who are growing up in kind of an artist colony in Australia. Um, one of the girls is the daughter of um, sort of this founder of Australian modernism and the other is a girl who is very much kind of taken in with the family and essentially moves into their life um, over time. It talks a lot about art, it, it's a lot about um, unmoored children, I suppose, um, and about family and community. It's a lot about friendship as well. Um, that's probably the bit of it that I enjoyed the most, about the friendship between young girls and how that develops as people get older. Um, there was very much a sense of uh, childhood kind of innocence being something that binds together, especially young girls. Um, I did enjoy parts of it and I enjoy kind of the feel of the book um, but it wasn't one that I was going to give like five stars to uh, it just I, I'm not really sure why uh, because I did like it and I think it has some really interesting things to say um, I guess maybe it's fairly gentle I don't know it, it's the kind of thing where I did actually you know I did really enjoy it but it just didn't stand out to me particularly uh, I'm definitely going to keep hold of it and it might be one that I reread in future um, and I quite like books around art and creativity anyway, so maybe that was something that appealed to me. Um, but yeah, I don't think I've heard too many people talk about this one, so if you have read it and you have some thoughts to share, please do down below. And the next one I have is non-fiction, and this one is South and West by Jane Didion. Um, these are um, supposedly rough drafts of stuff you've written in travel notebooks, but if I wrote this, <laughs> it wouldn't 
be a rough draft. It's just beautiful the whole way through, really. Um, and it's around like, travel. She goes to New Orleans and she's talking about that. She um, then sort of travels around um, a lot of a lot of the South and then eventually moves moves on back, um, sort of to to California and talks about California a bit and how her how I suppose different parts of the country can kind of encapsulate America in different ways. It was quite interesting um, as a kind of thought process, but I think the thing I was most impressed with was just how finished her unfinished work is. Um, so I'm going to read you just the first um, sentence and you'll see what I mean. Um, so it says, In New Orleans in June the air is heavy with sex and death. Not violent death, but death by decay. Overripeness. Rotting. Death by drowning, suffocation, fever of unknown etiology. Yeah, I just love her writing. Um, it was enjoyable. I've enjoyed other stuff that she's written more, um, just because I think, I think probably if you're American, this might connect with you more. But I don't feel as though I know enough about the nuances of different locations in the US to get as much from it as I maybe would have done if I was native. And the next one I have is a collection of short stories. This one is Out of the Deep by Walter de la Mer. Um, I actually DNF'd this one, but I am going to keep hold of it because it's a bit of a complicated relationship I've had with this book. Um, in essence, he writes a sort of very purple prose, um, supernatural, creepy little stories. Now the ones that are written, either from a child's perspective or heavily written around the experience of children and the supernatural, I loved. <laughs> There's one in here called Seton's Aunt that's brilliant. Um, there is one called The Riddle, which is fantastic. Um, and another one called The Guardian, which I really liked. And all of those were ones with child protagonists or heavy child's interest, if that makes sense. But the ones from an adult's perspective, I really didn't like. Um, and the reason I DNF'd it is I actually went through and started reading lots of them and the ones I knew I wasn't going to like I stopped reading so I have actually read most of this book. I read, I think I read probably about 60% right the way through and then skipped through The Recluse, Crew, Revenant and The Game at Cards um, just because from what I already get, got from the book I didn't think I was going to like them. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I kind of get why his work's been anthologised so much and why he hasn't done so well on his own because actually individual stories are great but I don't love him as a writer overall. But I'm going to keep hold of it. As I say, some of them I really liked so I'm just going to keep hold of it for them. <laughs> I might reread Seaton's Aunt at some stage and that was probably my favourite. And the next one I'm afraid I didn't get on with either. And this one is The Keeper of Lost Things by Ruth Hogan. And this was my pick for my In Real Life book club. Um, it was the first book we chose and we chased it because we weren't, we weren't really sure what everyone liked to read and it had done really well. It was on like the Waterstones top selling list. Um, I think it won or it was one of the shortlist for the um, Book For My Bag campaign, Reader's Choice. Um, it's about a man who collects things that other people have lost and kind of makes this little library of things. Um, and he tasks his assistant with returning these um, when he comes to the end of his kind of career of doing this. Um, I found it really predictable. I found um, that I probably within <laughs> sort of the first 20 pages could be like, yep, I know everything that's going to happen from here on. And there was nothing that really surprised me about the book. Um, yeah, it was just one of those ones that if I hadn't had a reason for reading it, I really wouldn't have bothered reading it. But I'm glad I did. I'm glad that I finished it because it was good to chat about with other people and find what things we felt were similar and dissimilar. Um, but yeah, we are reading The Good People by Hannah Kent next, which I think could be better. Uh, it's more at my street. I think it's probably more what we're looking for as a group. So yeah, but I didn't love this one, I'm afraid. And the next one I have is a classic. It is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, it's also got the bottle imp in here. Now, I quite like both, but I actually preferred the bottle imp. Um, I think probably because I didn't really know how it was going to go. Um, whereas Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is so famous that everyone knows what happens. Um, the bottle imp, on the other hand, was about um, a imp <laughs> that could grant um, sort of any wish that you wanted. Um, however, the person who was kind of left with this um, would 
go to hell. So if you didn't get rid of it before you died, you were necessarily going to go to hell. There was nothing you could do about it. And the only way to get rid of it was to sell it for a lower price than the price you bought it for. So um, we follow a man who has bought it fairly late on into the bottle's life, so it is very cheap. Um, and it kind of unfolds from there. But that story I really liked. Um, and probably would have been like a four star. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I just knew what was going to happen. And I didn't feel like I could really like it much because it just felt... I just knew exactly what was going to happen. <laughs> and it just felt a little bit pointless. I, I don't know. I don't know, I didn't really know what I was expecting, but yeah, um, I'm glad I've read it at least. <laughs> I feel like I, I now, I can now say that I've read it, if nothing else. And the next one I have, I absolutely loved, um, and this is Beast by Paul Kings North. I've been staring at this book for such a long time and just kept not buying it, and I'm so glad I've read it. Um, this is a book about a man who sort of abandons his entire family, in essence, to go and find himself on Exmoor. I assume it's Exmoor because it's got the Exmoor beast in it <laughs> and I think mostly I love this because of the fact that this is where I grew up and the Exmoor beast was a real thing when I was a kid so um, everyone, like all children who seem to grow up in these parts, someone has seen it. Um, there was a girl at my school called Megan who swore down that she had seen the Exmoor Beast and I believed her like a hundred percent. There were these kind of stories, and which were maybe true, um, about the fact that two wildcats um, were supposedly on Exmoor um, after the UK passed a law saying that people couldn't keep wildcats as pets and there had been these there's quite a lot of land in, around this part of the UK and people have been keeping these cats on large private estates. Um, they actually sent in the marines to try and shoot the wildcats because they said that they were having this issue in that they knew um, and it, it was in Devon basically that there was uh, sort of like 300 sheep that had been mauled by a wildcat so um, there definitely was at some stage something that was killing large quantities of sheep but it's just come into folklore. Anyway that's enough about the Exmoor Beast. But so <laughs> I think for me the, the kind of threat and fear that he felt um, was something that I could kind of recognise but the book itself is kind of more than that it's about it's very much about kind of life and the big questions and the human condition um, but all told as uh, all told as though someone is seeing the world for the first time the, the way that it felt for me and it's a bit of a weird way to explain it but it's the only thing that I can quite think that feels the same is when you first start playing a video game that you've never played before that is open world and you just start wandering and trying to figure out how the world works it kind of felt like the character was doing that through reality and it was just really satisfying um, it gave a really fresh perspective on the world and wildlife and um, life I think the, the main character is an asshole, but it didn't really matter it was more interesting just to see what he did so yeah I really highly recommend this one I think I've nattered about it for the about long enough, but I've been giving it and pushing this on everyone that I know for the moment. The next one that I read was Broadcast by Liam Brown. Um, it's a really short little book about a man who signs up to, um, I guess, like a, a version of Big Brother essentially, where he um, broadcasts his thoughts and his interpretation of the world live through a streaming. Um, website where people can log in and see what he's thinking at any one time. It's kind of about the internet and mostly about YouTube to be honest um, and about YouTube celebrities. I didn't really like it if I'm honest. Um, I, I kind of felt as though there's a lot of negativity around people who do vlogging as their life if you know what I mean, like that's their career. And I don't really get that. I think it's really interesting and I think it's, you know, a really big accomplishment. There's very much a sense of it just being kind of navel gazing. Um, and I didn't like it for that just because of, you know, those elements for me just made it, just made it um, kind of all feel fairly farcical. There, there was also the issue of the fact that um, the individual who is the big baddie has um, very um, obvious facial scarring and from when I read that in like chapter one 
I was like, well, you're going to make this man the baddie then, aren't you? And as it, as it went on and he became very much the baddie, I was just kind of like, that's just really lazy. So yeah, unfortunately I didn't go on with this one. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I will send it for review, so I always feel it bad when I don't go on with stuff that I'm sent, but I've got to be honest. The next one I read was If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. This is the proof copy. Um, the real one um, has a little bird on it. I really like this book. It's about a group of friends who are in a Shakespearean acting school um, and one of their number is killed. Um, it's kind of secret history-esque in that it is a kind of who's done it slash how do people cope with um, the death or potentially murder of their friend. Um, but the thing I liked most was actually the setting. Um, so. In this school there are lots of details that I just thought were really interesting and completely just kind of took me to that world. So things like um, each term they had a big play that they would put on, a Shakespeare play, always Shakespeare, um, in which everybody would learn their own lines but was never rehearsed and uh, you had to react almost in real time with your lines to other people who you didn't know who was playing who or where they were going to come out from um, and it was like almost like a strange live response and I just thought that sounded like so much fun I would love to watch that um, and the, the kind of you know the, the very academic setting and lots of literary references just really ticked a lot of boxes for me um, it was really escapist it was really fun and I wasn't really expecting to love this one. I thought it was going to be like a worse <laughs> secret history. I thought it was going to be a bit of a ripoff, and I loved it. Um, and it has really made me want to read a bit more Shakespeare. So, yeah, I'd I'd really recommend it. I was it was a complete surprise, and I'm really glad that I kept hold of it and did actually read it. So yeah. And the next one I have is The Murder of Holland uh, by Pierre Jules, and this is a Denmark um, literary crime novel. Um, and I did, I did like it. And I think it's really important to say that this book isn't really like a crime thriller. It's not really at all a crime thriller. It's a literary novel that has a crime within it. Um, and the murder isn't the bit that it focuses on, despite the title. Uh, it's very much about kind of relationships and loss and the suddenness of change in life. And yeah, I, I thought that was a really interesting take. I haven't read a lot of literary crime. Um, I've mostly read like pure thrillers, which I used to read when I was like 18, 19, um, and then literary stuff that doesn't really deal with crime. So it was a nice, it was a nice kind of interlude, and um, I felt as though the main character was actually really relatable, if unlikable. I don't know what that says about me, um, but yeah. So I liked it. I'd be interested in seeing if there's anything else by this author that I could pick up because the style was just um, just nice, and as I say, you know. Um, the fat characters are relatable even when they're very unlikable or when they have sort of flaws. Um, it's something I really like, especially female characters being unlikable and yet relatable. We're currently on 25 minutes in, so hopefully I can edit this down. Um, but the next one is Crash by J.G. Ballard. This is a strange book, guys. Um, this is about a man who is uh, sort of he is sexually aroused by car crashes and by the dead bodies of car crash victims, particularly how the automobile itself interacts with flesh. <laughs> um, it's gruesome, but that isn't so much what made it strange. I think what made it so strange is that it is constantly violent. It is... Um, there is no point in this novel where you do not realise that you're reading about exactly what I've just said. Sort of every page, every paragraph, every section is about this violence and this interaction. Um, I think, for me, it it very much about the interaction between humans and technology and about um, the ways in which the technology we use are extensions of ourselves and impact ourselves. Um, and about the ways in which we um, view ourselves in relation to tools and automation. Though I may be speaking up my arse, I don't know. Um, and I, I, did, I did like that as a way of doing that. Um, I have to say that uh, it does put you off driving, <laughs> um, because it's essentially description after description of all the things that can happen to people in car accidents. Um, but in a in a really odd way, 
we don't really talk about car accidents themselves and what happens all that much. It's something that we are aware is kind of a constant. Like, you know, you constantly, whenever you go on long journeys, will find you're delayed by an accident. But actually talking about what happens and how people try and prevent that and how people die is something I knew nothing about. And I found that quite interesting just as a kind of academic thing. Um, but it was hard to read. And I think the constant sex um, with the violence mean, means that's something you, you actually have to take breaks from um, because it, make, makes, it made me feel a little bit sick every now and again um, just because it's so constant and it really doesn't let up even for a second um, but I'm really glad I read it, it's one that um, it didn't do quite what I thought it was going to um, but I think it did something that was actually a little bit more interesting so yeah, let's crash. And then the next one I have is another collection of short stories Trickery by Roald Dahl. Um, I've read a fair few of these ones now, these niche short stories. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I find that these are ones that I can dip into and read in an afternoon. Um, I like his stories, they have good twists to them. Um, I felt quite sorry for some of the ladies in these stories. Um, I felt as though there was, a few of them had a really rough deal. Um, but it was also slightly satisfying. Um, yeah, as it, as it kind of mentions, these ones will, will um, go with people being tricked or misled in some way. Um, and um, it actually ha it has Champion of the World in there um, and the piece about the uh, pheasants and the sleeping pills. And I haven't read that in a really long time. <laughs> I really enjoyed just rereading that. Um, it actually made me want to go back and read some of the Roald Dahl's like, children's stories that I remember from being little. Um, but yeah, it wasn't um, anything that was... like I think I preferred other ones of his, in his short stories, but it was just really enjoyable. And I think I actually quite like having something that is fairly safe, but that you're kind of still waiting for a twist. Um, to read on sort of lazy Sundays, so yeah, not not saying that it, everything has to be life changing. Sometimes I just want some little short stories that um, kind of gently give me a nice sort of cozy English feeling. I don't know, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that is that's my feelings on trickery. <clears throat> and the next one I don't think I've spoken about, but if I have, forgive me. Um, it's We've Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. Um, my first Shirley Jackson and I really liked it. Um, it's the kind of story I don't think you're going to forget um, quickly. It's It reminded me a little bit of um, To Kill a Mockingbird in that you have a story very much led by children that talks about really adult themes. This book has a sense of isolation, um, it has separation from um, members of the community, um, suspicion, um, violence, uh, othering, um, as well as speaking about the relationships that develop inside of that situation, um, bonds that families have sort of despite uh, very negative things happening and I really liked all of that. Uh, it was also, it was another one that had a really strong setting to it, I really felt as though I was there when I was reading it and the garden especially, I feel as though I could have, or the kitchen, I could happily kind of have a picture in my head, which I really rarely do with books, of the garden and the kitchen. Um, and yeah, I definitely want to read more Shirley Jackson in future. Um, I didn't find that it was scary, I don't think that I found it um, creepy or scary, but I found that um, the characters and the setting were just really beautifully done. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be picking up more of her in time. Um, and I like the kind of darkness that's in there as well. So yeah, I'm really, really glad I picked it up finally. Okay, we're nearly at half an hour, so I need to get going now. Um, but the last one I have to talk to you about is My Absolute Darling by Gabriel Talent. Um, this is a book that has been, I think, a very Marmite book for lots of people. Um, it's about a young girl who has a very challenging and abusive relationship with her father. Um, and her growing up and her coping with her life and um, essentially being kind of pushed to being a very wild person um, and very self-sufficient because of the abuse that she faces in her home. Um, I actually really enjoyed it but I can understand why lots of people wouldn't. It's a little bit similar to A Little Life in that respect. That was what it kind of felt like to me whilst it's a different kind of book and a different kind of protagonist and all of those sorts of things. Um, because I think some people could find the violence and um, 
the things that she's going through gratuitous and be turned off the rest of the story. Now, I think one of the things that I really liked uh, is that I think that lots of people who have gone through negative things or abusive um, experiences in their life hold fantasies or images in their head of being able to do something similar to what this character does. Uh, that's not to say, for those of you who read it, that people want to be hurting people, but uh, it's the idea that you could have control of that situation. So that might seem a bit strange, um, I do completely understand that, but I think there's a lot that Turtle, who's the main character in here, has that you could easily see how it can become something that becomes this kind of fantasy in people who have been abused's head. She, she's very self-sufficient, she um, knows kind of the woods by like the back of her hand, she can look after herself, she um, knows how to uh, sort of fire weapons and use knives and she's very careful and meticulous and uh, is able to do things um, and look after herself in a really strong way and I think that's what I enjoyed. It felt very much um, I guess like kind of reading one of those kind of fantasies and it, that sounds really strange um, and don't get me wrong what I'm not trying to say is that people who are um, people who suffered from abuse in some way are necessarily violent but I think there is ordinarily some desire for a comeuppance or some desire for an equalisation of power and that's what I liked about this book is it felt as though it was exploring that. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be very Marmite, some people won't like that element of it at all, um, some people who have suffered abuse may completely agree with, the, agree with me or disagree with me, um, and I think that's absolutely fine, uh, but I just think it's it's rare that you actually read about that kind of thing, um, and I found it really personally satisfying, <laughs> I don't know, it just felt fair in some way. Um, and she's a strong girl, she's a strong female character as well and it, it was just really a uh, pleasant reading experience to have someone who had suffered so much um, still have such a strong personality and morality and doubts and issues and still be kind of a full person so I really liked it. Um, but yeah, that, that's everything that I've read um, in the month of October. It's been a long old video, my camera stopped recording. Um, I have been chatting to you guys for so long, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these and what your thoughts were. Um, I really hope that I've expressed myself okay throughout this. I always get concerned when I film really long videos because um, whilst you guys see kind of a finished product, uh, remember that I'm thinking of all of this off the top of my head and I never want to cause offence or make assumptions um, when I'm talking but naturally you kind of, you, you do, these aren't scripted videos um, so yeah I hope that this come across okay especially around that last one um, but yeah I, I anyway I, I, think, I think it was fine <laughs> and I will chat to you guys soon in my next video which is going to be my non-fiction November TBR I think um, and yeah I'm looking forward to reading some non-fiction next month there was not a lot in this month so yeah be chatting about that one soon and hope you're all well see you then bye